Hi, Miri Asset. Hi, Indonesia. Today, I have the four horsemen for you. Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. Or should I call it Meta? The four was written by Professor Scott Galloway, and it reveals the hidden DNA of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, now Meta, and Google. It's an amazing book meticulously researched and down-to-earth funny. In this video, I will be mostly talking about the four tech giants that were mentioned in the book. The crux of this book boils down to you. How did these companies get to be so connected with billions of people? The answer, they have captured the essence of basic human needs. Google responded to our desire to seek God. Our brain is robust enough to ask very complex questions such as, why do humans have to die? What lies beyond the end of space? I don't know. But we're only humans and we don't have answers to all of those questions. That's why we sought out for a super being. And the divine power above us will have a solution and spit back an answer to the poor humans. Google is our modern day God and we don't know how they find everything but everybody trusts Google. Facebook. Facebook touches upon the basic instinct of humans, love. There is a study that, if you, that you live longer if you love more. Hence, humans have this desire to be loved. The physical act of caring and loving each other extends your life. Facebook is sharing love at immense scale. Ready to click that like button and share your love with me? Next, throughout the history of mankind, the number one illness was malnutrition. And take a step further into the darkness is death by starvation, which is a bad way to go. So our desire to collect more to avoid starvation is embedded into our DNA. Less is bad and more is always better. Look around you. How many pens do you have on your desk? This is you know, this is the strategy of all businesses, including Walmart, China, and Amazon. Finally, Apple touches on your basic instinct, the desire to procreate. In other words, the desire to mate. Samsung makes better phones, really. But if you own an Apple, it signals that you are wealthy, educated, successful, and have good genes. Not me, though. So if you mate with me, who's an iPhone owner, you have a better chance that your child will survive longer than if you mate with someone who owns a Xiaomi. Is that all you got? Let's talk about Amazon. Let's open up your closet and our cupboard. How many t-shirts do you have in your closet? Do you even wear the t-shirt that has been sitting down there for the past five years? How many cups and dishes do you need? You have more cups <laughs> than the number of chairs in your house, the seats that your outside guests need to sit in. And hey, Jeff, how many cars do you need? Wham, wham, wham. During the caveman era, survival was a big threat to humans, and it's still a big threat to humans. Still, 9 million people die every year of hunger. So humans have developed this strong desire to collect. The hunters, men, will go out there, identify the prey, kill, and bring it to the cave. There's no time to waste. When we bring a catch home, the gatherers, women, will identify the catch, look at the quality, can we eat this, touch the texture, and analyze. This is the reason why men and women have different shopping experience, right? Men have no time to waste. And women have to touch, feel, see, wear, and then make their decision. For Amazon, that prey was books. Easy to recognize, kill, and digest. And now, Amazon is the everything store. With amazing innovations such as the fulfillment centers and rocket, rocket delivery, humans can now buy everything that they need and even more stuff at Amazon that you really need at minimum efforts. Amazon will bring the catch with a big smile on their faces. 
Amazon has greater access to cheaper capital compared to anyone in the world. Through storytelling of Jeff's vision, which is building the Earth's biggest store, Amazon has reshaped the relationship between the company and the shareholders. Media also loves superstar CEOs, and they create a buzz around this big boss, right? Remember how Steve Jobs wore his uh, black turtleneck t-shirts because he didn't want to waste his time choosing what to wear every morning? Tech CEOs are now the new celebrities, and they give Amazon the spotlight and the capital. The era of rigid CEOs making decisions in the office is now over. You need to be out there and become superstars. By the way, this gentleman is Mr. Chung Ji Young from Hyundai Group. Now, cheap capital, access to cheap capital means crazy experiments. Now, there are two types of innovations. Number one type is an innovation whereby the leaders say, this is the future of the company. There's no turning back. We're betting everything. And if we fail, we risk, we risk our uh, sustainability of the company. Type two innovations are small, small innovations, right? And then you, you start with small and say, hey, if it's not working, well, we'll just forget about it, right? We'll try something new. Uh, Amazon's Fire Phone was not a very big hit, right? I mean, they first started off with, uh, you know, small money and small number of human capital. It doesn't work. You bring it back, right? We, we're, we're out of here. And then, you know, they try new stuff like restaurants, which also was not a very big hit, you know, and then if it doesn't fail, you know, forget about it, right? At Miriasa, we had the similar, we had similar situation. We had this thing called up or down survival, whereby we put some, you know, human capital and some, and some money into this project. It didn't work out. But when we tried the Hots Championship, we had actually one or two people, you know, like supporting this idea. And later on, it, it was it was a jackpot and we put a lot of people and human capital into this, uh, which, you know, ended up in a very huge success. Now, if you have access to cheap capital, you can continue these crazy experiments, which is a motivating, motivating driver for the shareholders, employees, and also customers. Now, next, Normal companies would think, how can we build the greatest advantage for the least amount of capital, right? But Amazon says, with how can we build the greatest advantage that's very, very expensive that no one else can afford, right? This is something very, very unconventional because Amazon has access to unlimited cheap capital. We all know that fulfillment centers are not cheap. But Amazon can make that investment decision easily because thanks to their superstar CEO, Jeff Bezos, oh, hi, they have access to unlimited cheap capital. These fulfillment centers give Amazon the str strongest competitive edge against competitors and create amazing customer value, i.e. rocket delivery. So on top of the unlimited cheap capital, you have consumers who subscribe to Amazon Prime. More people subscribe to Amazon Prime than people owning a telephone line, going to churches, and voting in the election. You can never dare follow Amazon's path, most likely because you don't have access to capital. Many marketing specialists believe that building a brand is a winning strategy, but they are wrong. Brand strategy in its, is in its sunset cycle. There was a time when wearing Levi's, Guess, Timberland, you know, was cool. Not anymore. People have no problem wearing quality functional products without a brand. I don't think Uniqlo is creating any brand image other than it is cheap and functional. And I don't have any problem wearing their clothes and wearing their clothes neither. Indeed, more and more people, more and more people are forgetting brands because everything is going online. I think more people are choosing to stay with Airbnb rather than stay at Hilton, for example. Voice is also killing the attributes that brands have spent billions of dollars to build. With voice such as Alexa, Siri, Google, consumers don't know the price or even see the color, packaging, display, etc. It's not widely popular, popular here in Indonesia, but when you ask Alexa to suggest batteries, it will suggest Amazon Basic, their private label brand, and play dumb about other choices. Sorry, that's all I found. 
Apple. I know you want these. An elegant yacht where you can party privately with friends and families. A fat diamond ring by De Beers that can win the heart of any woman you desire. The beautiful mesh texture of Bottega bag and the sexy curves of Ferrari. People have always wanted to look beautiful. During the French aristocracy, the noble class spent 3% of the nation's GDP on wigs, powders, and dresses. Fast forward centuries, and LeBron James is spending money on Beats, Rolex, and iPhone. People's desire to look beautiful has not changed at all. Why is that? Because humans' natural desire to mate. In the animal world, the alpha male rules the female crowd. The king sea lion will keep all the female sea lions to himself. Why is that? Because for women, if you mate with the alpha male, it increases the likelihood of your child surviving and becoming the next generation king. According to one study, the ratings of attractiveness were around 1,000 times more sensitive to salary for female rating males compared to males rating females. Hmm. The results indicate that higher economic status can offset lower physical attractiveness in men much more easily than in women. So for women, it doesn't really matter whether a man looks like this, as long as he is wearing a Patek Philippe, which cost about $100,000, not a swatch, which costs $70. In the human world, the alpha male is defined as the one who is able to own luxury items. Apple is a luxury and luxury means success. The, the iPhone is the clearest signal that you're closer to perfection and have more opportunities to mate. Apple doesn't want to sell to the mass public. They want to sell to the 1% of the successful population only. Look, Apple commands 19% of the smartphone sales volume market share, but controls 87% of the world's smartphone profits. If you take a look at the geographical comparison, iPhones are more dominant in developed countries. In the US, iPhone owners are rich white men. The five key attributes of luxury brands, number one, superstar CEO, no one can compete with Steve Jobs. Number two, artisanship. Apple's design is simplicity. And simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. They are just beautiful. Thirdly, vertical integration. Apple has the best stores in the world, right? And fourth, global reach. Never localize, right? Luxury brands define their own universe. That's why McD's, McDonald's is not a luxury brand it's a mass brand compare with Hermes which you know they never adjust to the local environment uh, five is premium prices luxury brand uh, do you think high status people would be interested in in a $20 scarf or a three three hundred dollars Hermes scarf right let's look at the case with Levi's and Gap Levi's created the coolest commercials, right? But Gab created best physical stores. Ads could broadcast a brand's image, but physical stores could go much further. They gave customers a place to step into the brand, to smell it, touch it, and the store is where Gab would build its brand equity. Let's face it, I think people know they're not likely to play like Federer, even if they buy a Rolex, right? And look at look at what happened to the revenue of the two uh, two companies. They diverted, right? Gab went up and Levi's went down. We know who's doing it right. So Steve Jobs convinced the board for capital in building its offline Apple stores. Most people figured the company was wrong, that Apple was a company marching towards irrelevance. The new trend was in e-commerce. How dumb was that, they thought. But everybody else was wrong. The iPhone drove Apple's shares, but the stores 
drove Apple's brand and margins. The stores are just so beautiful. Take a look at this beautiful store in Fifth Avenue, New York. This one is, uh, you know, a store in Seoul. This one is in Bangkok, right? And last but not least, this one is in London. Beautiful, beautiful. Just like Hermes and Louis Vuitton, Rolex, Apple wanted to have physical stores for customers to experience the, the product and their brands. The iPhone will not be the best phone for long. There's so many companies trying to play catch up, but Apple has a key advantage that no one has. The awesome 515 Apple stores. Can you buy Rolex online? No, and you know what? You actually have to wait in line to buy any luxury items now. It's not the stores that are dying, but the middle class and the stores serving them. Most of the stores that are located in or serving middle class households are struggling. By comparison, stores in affluent neighborhoods are holding strong. As Darwin said, they can imitate you, but they can't duplicate you because you've got something special. They can imitate you, but they can't duplicate you because you got something special. Xiaomi and Samsung can build better phones but they are less likely to replicate the romance and the connection and the general awesomeness of the Apple stores. Is that all you got? So what's the good thing about all of this? When you're positioned as a luxury brand, it gives you high margins. Apple has high margins uh, of 30% plus, which is in between Hermes and Ferrari. And with such a wide regional coverage, it sells like cupcakes. So Apple is selling high margin Ferraris at Toyota volume. Oh, and guess what? Miriasa Securitas Indonesia's margins are at 55%, which is higher than Adamus, Apple, Ferrari, and Samsung. Now moving on to Facebook, or should I call this Meta? If you take away sleeping time 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. and working hours from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., that's a lot of time spent on Facebook services. Facebook, 37 minutes, Instagram, 29 minutes, and WhatsApp, 28 minutes. So we spend 94 minutes per day using Facebook. A study found that on Facebook, the top descriptors to complete the phrase, my husband is, are the best, my best friend, amazing, the greatest, so cute. On Google, under the cloak of anonymity, one of the top five ways to complete the phrase is also amazing, but the other four were a jerk, annoying, gay, mean. However, Facebook isn't fooled. It sees the truth. So do its advertisers. This is what makes the company so powerful. Harvard Medical School did a long study on relationships and they found out that happiness is love. Love is a function of intimacy and the depth and number of interactions we have with people. At its best, Facebook taps into our need for these relationships and uh, helps nourish them. We've all felt it, right? I mean, there's something satisfying in rediscovering your elementary school uh, friend 20 years ago and keeping in touch with them after they move away. When friends post pictures of their newborn baby, we get a delicious hit called dopamine. Let's take a look at how CNN makes money. The main source of revenue for the media company is advertising. CNN is able to get advertisers to advertise on their channel because it creates good content like Amanpour, uh, Larry King, Anderson Cooper, etc. And when contents are good, Quality viewers like you and I watch the channel. Well, sorry, I was lying. I'm not a quality viewer because I don't watch TNN. I get news from SNS now. Anyway, in order to create good content, CNN has to invest in the studio, uh, interior, uh, high-paid superstar hosts, reporters, cameraman, lighting guy, you know, microphone lady, makeup artist, so on and so forth. All costs. Then they get to air uh, their show and they have advertisers, advertisements in the middle of the show. This is complex business, I tell you. Now, Facebook is also a media company, but it doesn't have to make those sophisticated contents. They don't need reporters. They don't need cameramen or they don't need makeup artists, right? Uh, Facebook benefits 
from free contents that you create for them, which are watched and liked by your close friends. Remember our desire to be loved? Take Miri Asif, for example. We had this dress code game and everybody voluntarily uploaded their contents, right? And I clicked like for all the contents created by our employees because I love you, I love them, I care for my employees. And Facebook sneaks in and creates this ad in between my employees' dress, ca dress code game posts. But what's interesting about this is that it's very smart. I was discussing about traveling next month with my family and look, the sponsored ad says, plan your perfect escape. This is so well curated compared to the baby powder uh, ad that I saw while watching TV yesterday. Totally irrelevant for me. However, Facebook doesn't want the public and the investors to consider them as a media company, right? There are two reasons behind that. Number one, because media companies only get media core valuations. Take a look. Google is worth 1.9 trillion. Facebook Meta is worth close to 1 trillion. But in comparison, Comcast and Walt Disney, they're valued at 0 0.2, 0 0.3 trillion respectively, right? Um, as we all know, the four horsemen are addicted to crazy rich valuations. The founders and shareholders become filthy rich and with crazy rich valuations, they're able to retain good talent. Second reason is literally crazy. Did you know that 68% of Americans get news through social media? I mean, respectable companies in the news business recognize their role in shaping the worldview of their customers. You know, editorial objectivity, fact-checking, journalism ethics, civil disclosures. But all of these are pretty costly things to implement and lots of work too. It's just like becoming a CNN of its own. This is not good for profits and not good for share prices. Um, I saw on the news that Putin and Trump are very good friends. Accepting the responsibility of the editor in chief for the world, you know, Facebook has to make judgments and possibly choose to side with a view. And that's not good for businesses because if you side with one camp, say for example, Rep Republican side or the Democrat side, you tend to lose the others on the other side of the camp, right? Also controlling fake news is not good for your clicks too, which is big money. You know what? I heard and saw on the news that Putin, Trump and Kim Jong-un are best friends now. Now, Facebook created this platform which users can upload, uh, you know, like a user created content. So let's say a mother of a newborn baby posts her baby on Facebook. Facebook acquires free contents from her and then sells those contents to the advertisers. The advertisers then analyze her uploaded contents and create advertisements suitable for her. Which, is the, which in this case is baby lotion. Facebook is not stealing the baby pictures, but using innovative technology to borrow her pictures and making advertising strategies much, much more efficient. That's what I call world-class borrowing. Our last horseman is Google. Humans have a big brain that can process complex thoughts. We ask questions, sometimes silly, secretive, sometimes scary. But we're only human, right? We're only human. Uh, we don't have answers to all those questions we ask. That is why we seek for a God. For example, we know as parents how painful it is to see your child sick, right? You want to know why your child has high fever, diarrhea, rash all over his body or her body, and you pray to God for your child's safety and health. That pray to God is usually unanswered. But Google, our modern day God, is so divine that it can answer any questions or prayers. In fact, we confess everything to Google. I mean the deepest secrets inside our hearts. The search engine is in its pure white form, no banners around the search box, colorful logo that makes us feel like it's an innocent search engine that we can trust. It also discloses clearly which search results are organic and which are paid. Another layer of trust. We confess to Google things, things we would not share with our teachers, priests, husband, wife, parents, best friends, or even our family doctors. You ask Google whether to quit your job right? Why there is rash on my skin or even how to rob a bank without getting caught. We have no idea how Google gets all the answers, 
and how the algorithm works, but we place huge trust in the search engine. Compare that with its competitor, Yahoo.com, which is pretty messy and chaotic in my personal view. Did you know that there are 3.5 billion searches on Google every single day? And guess what? One out of six searches have never been asked before by anyone. What does this mean? This means that every time you search something on Google, it becomes smarter and Google will know more about you than you. What is Google's mission? Google is, uh, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. But if we change the word useful to something else like make big bucks, that becomes scary. Google is so likable. I mean, look at these two faces. They're the same person. One has a serious face and the other one has a cute face. Who are you likely to say hello to? This is a perfect example of serious Microsoft, right? And cute Google. There you go. You know, Microsoft, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer were so serious uh, back in the days about everything. Back in the 80s and 90s, they were so serious and untouchable that nobody wanted to be in a meeting with the two gentlemen. Compare that with Google, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who are so lovable. The pose in their 70s posture, wearing blue and red shirts and shouts out, don't be evil. You know, they're still cute after they crushed all its competitor, including Microsoft, Bing and Yahoo. Remember Jeff? With all the valuable information in the world collected, Google is now reaching its arms to dominate the world. Google Maps, Google Sci, uh, Google News, Google Library, Google Earth, and Google Android. Google is everywhere, and with greater reach comes greater information, which is used to, again, gain control of everything. In the later part of this book, Scott addresses eight key attributes of the four tech giants. Uh, they are product differentiation, visionary capital, global reach, likability, vertical integration, artificial intelligence, accelerant, and geography. And in this presentation, I will remove the self-explanatory items and highlight three points, which are product differentiation, visionary capital, and AI. The four horsemen have differentiated products and services, which begins with moving, removing the friction around people's lives. Amazon removed the friction of bringing your catch from the field to your cave. In fact, whatever you picked up from the supermarket is likely to be more expensive than the price tag on Amazon. And guess what? It's brought to you with a big smile for less than the cost of gasoline to go there and back. Uber removed the pain of waiting for a taxi, hoping that no one cuts in line, right? Remember when you were hailing taxis back then? And then a guy comes out of nowhere and then cuts in front of you and takes your taxi? That is so stressful. Also think about, you know, like uh, whether you have enough cash to, uh, you know, to give to the driver is also painful. You only have 100,000 rupiah bills in your wallet and the ride is only 10,000 rupiah and the driver has no change. Ugh. And remember back in the days when you wanted to find information for your assignment and how stressful it is uh, to find the right book you needed in the library? Well, look no further. Google has all the answers you need at a click of a button. Mm -hmm. Facebook removed the physical barriers for people to connect to each other. Sharing love could not be any more difficult. Yes, it's good to share hearts and likes, but it also uh, made work communication so efficient as well. So it comes with an issue that working hours are now 24 seven as well. Now, if you don't have a differentiated products and services, you will have to resort to a dull yet expensive tool called advertising. I don't think I've ever seen Google advertise itself on TV. We have to talk about visionary capital. Visionary in terms of the simple yet powerful vision of the company, just like Google's organizing the world's information and Facebook's connecting the world. They're so simple and compelling reasons to buy the stock. Also equally important is capital, which is the winning ingredient for the big tech giants. The ultimate gift in this digital age is a superstar CEO who has the storytelling ability to share his or her vision with stakeholders, 
shareholders, customers, employees, and the public, and get unlimited access to capital. Why is capital so important? Because capital is one of the most important ingredients in winning the battle against competitors. During the World War II, Germans had better people, better leaders, better morale, better technology, the Panzer tanks. On the other hand, the Allies had inferior tanks, the Bradley tanks. But the Allies had cut off the Germany's uh, you know, supply chain, and Germans only had one gallon of gasoline when engaging in a war, compared to the Allies, which had 38 gallons of gas. When they meet in the field, the Allies would not dare engage in battle. They will say, over here, over here, over here, over here. And they'll just fool around with the Panzer tanks until they run out of gas. When the Panzer tanks stop moving, the Allies will approach them and destroy them with hammers. Thanks to superstar CEO Jeff Bezos, Amazon engages in a war with competitors with 38 gallons of gasoline. Competitors have better people, better motivation, better technology, but they only have one gallon of gas. When Amazon announces that it will engage in a new business such as dental supplies, drugs, sporting goods, groceries, its competitors' share prices plunge in the first 24 hours of the trading session. Last but not least, AI. The early stage of marketing was all about demographic marketing. Someone in their 40s and living in the city, like these three gentlemen here, will always like pickup trucks. That's not true. The second developed version of marketing was social marketing, whereby people who have liked the same posts are likely to have similar tastes, like this 20-year-old girl and an 80-year-old gentleman. That's not true as well. But thanks to AI, we now have this technique called behavioral marketing. Behavioral marketing is when my behaviors are captured by the AI and is processed to create customized advertising for that person. If I stay on Tiffany website, and I'm searching keywords like engagement rings, then it means that I'm planning to get engaged or married, right? So with AI, we can track behavior at a level and scale previously unimaginable. It fine tunes tech companies to target the right person with the right advertisement. Now, I don't have to watch baby powder ads on TV, again, which is completely irrelevant for me, and watch more travel-sponsored ads. The best AI I recently encountered was the autoplay of the next episodes on Netflix. Now, the moral of the story. The moral of the story comes, is broken down into four parts. Number one, capture the essence of basic human needs. Business and product strategy should be centered around customers. Remember Amazon's customer obsession? Number two, be visionary leaders. The act of storytelling and sharing our vision to investors, customers, employees, and the public is highly important because you gain access to unlimited uh, cheap capital. Number three, innovate, differentiate. We need to continuously innovate our products and services or else we'll have to resort to this dull yet expensive tool called marketing and advertising. Last but not least, be cute.